Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please be seated. We would like to start with the program. We've got a lot on offer, and um, you know we want to ensure that uh, all the speakers get their fair time allocated. And we also very much look forward to your active participation in this uh, event. I am your host for tonight. Uh, my name is Jesper, and I am a director, a board director of OIST. And I welcome you very, very much. And it's a great honor to have as our first speaker the Prime Minister of Japan. Prime Minister Kishida actually visited Japan, an uh, OIST. Prime Minister Kishida visited Japan. <laughs> yeah, he did. They let him in. <laughs> um, Prime Minister Kishida actually visited OIST on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the reversion uh, of Okinawa to Japan, and also on the occasion of the 10th anniversary celebration of OIST. So without further ado, Prime Minister Kishida's message from OIST. あの、先生方、また学生の皆さんから、ま、それぞれのこの、え、取り組みについてお話を聞かせていただきました。またオイストのその環境についてもま、お話を聞かせていただきました。あの、具体的なあの話を聞かせていただき、大いに参考になったと
down to entrepreneurship, down to economic development, down to, yes, we are going to ask you for donations at the end. But without further ado, to get things going, let's start with the contents. Professor Doya, one of the leading lights. Um, I'm not going to introduce you. You've got it in the introduction, but um, very much looking forward. The stage is yours. Doya Sensei. It's okay. <laughs> we start. It's, it's, part, it's part of global best practices. You have to improvise. Right. Okay. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's start. はい、皆さんこんにちは。今日はこのような機会を与えてくださいまして大変ありがとうございます。え、私はま、ま、あの、機械学習人工知能と、ま、農学の研究をしているので、ま、それについての話を今日はさせていただきたいと思います。え、で
でそういう形で,です、ねまあ、脳科学の研究と、まあ、人工知能の研究というのはお互いあの触発し合ったり助け合ったりという形であの進化してきたんだなというふうに思っています。でそういったことをもとにです、ね、われわれはその加研費の5年計画のプロジェクト、進学地領域というので、脳科学と人工知能というのを、まあ、去年まで進めてきています。でえーまあ、その教科学習というのは、まあ、あの細かい意識をフォローする必要はないですけれども、まあ、今の状態や行動がどれくらい将来的な報酬につながるかという予測をするということで予測をもとに実際に行動を選択するということでその行動を取ってみた結果から学習するという、まあ、そういったステップを繰り返していくわけなんですね。でこういいったステップをいかに実現するかということですねであとそういったあのこういった学習アルドの必ずいくつかのパラメーターがあるわけなんですけどもこういったようなものをうまく制御するということが工学的には非常に重要な課題になってくるわけです。例えば最近ですとこういった報酬の予測に、えーまあ、ディープニューラルネットワークをうまく使うやり方が発見されたということが大きなブレイクスツーになってきてるわけですね。であとまたこういったあのパラメーターこのガンマというのはどれくらい先の報酬まで予測するかということを調べる決定するパラメーターなんですね。まあ、この場でもその投資に関わっている方々はそのある企業が今すぐどれくらい収益を上げるかということで長期的にどれくらい成長するかっていうことをいつも考えながら投資の検討されていると思うんですけどもそれと同じようなことがいろんなロボットや人間や動物の学習でもありうるわけなんですね。で例えばあのこれはあのこのロボットがカメラでこの電池パックを見つけて、まあ、それに向かって進んでいくという行動を学習しているところで、まあ、だんだん学習するとですねその見つけた電池パックに対して割とまっすぐ進んでいくことになるわけですね。でこっち側のロボットっていうのは初めはなんかあの試行錯誤をしていたんだけどもこれは電池パックが見えるんだけども、うん、なかなか取りに行かないと。で本当にすごく近くに来ると、えー、取りに行くんだけれどもあの一定以上離れているとなんか興味がないというなんかそういった引きこもり的な状態になってしまったロボットなんですね。でなんでこういうことが起こるかっていうとこのパラメーターガンマというのは、まあ、どれくらい先の報酬まであの評価に入れるかってことを決めるパラメーターなんですね。でだから途中で電池を使っても最終的に電源が充電ができるということでこのガンマの設定が大きければそういった行動を取るんだけどもこれがちっちゃいとガンマ自動産業っていうのはどんどんゼロになってしまうのでもうやらない方がましだということでなんか打つ的なロボットができてしまうというわけですね。で、あのまあ逆にその今はいいんだけども後であのひどい失敗がしを食うというような時にこのガンマの設定が必要とそれがなかなか、えー、抑えられないという。まあ、衝動的な行動を取ったりするというわけでこういったその学習アルゴミの分野ではパラメーター設定というのはその学習ロボットの性格を決めるような非常に面白いパラメーターなんですね。であのでこれはまああの面白いだけじゃなくて、まあ、あのこういったことを人間や,や動物は何でうまく調整できちゃってるんだろうかということは脳科学にとっても非常に重要なあのテーマだと思うんですね。であの僕らはそういったことは例えば脳の中ではセロトニンという物質をやってるんじゃないかということをあの仮説として提案したわけです。まあ、一つのあのきっかけとしてはこのうつ病を治す薬っていうのは多くが、まあ、脳のセロトニンの働きを高める仕組みを持ってですね、まあ、こういった状態をこっちにも引き戻すということをやってるんじゃないかということを考えたわけです、まあ、そういったことを含めてですねその脳の中の、えー、脳幹から広く投射してる、えー、のードーパミンとか、えー、アセチルコリンノルアデナリンセロトニンといった物質がですね学習の進み方を制御するパラメーター制御をしてるんじゃないかと。いうようなことを仮説として考えてきたわけです。その中でも特に僕らはそのセロトニンの役割というものを脳科学の実験でまあ非常に調べてきていてですね。これはその遺伝子改変をして青い光を当てるとセロトニンがあの。ニュー発,発するニューロンが活動するというそういったネズミなんですけどもこれはあのこの餌場に来て餌が来るのを待ってるんですけども、まあ、黄色い光では刺激されないんですが青い光を刺激してやるとですねあの普通はまあ十数秒しかな持たないのが20秒近く待てるようになるという形でより遅れてくる報酬も計算に入れて行動するということがなんかセロトニンがやってるんだということが実験的にも検証することができるようになりました。まあ、最近はさらにそれを発展させて、まあ、その時間だけじゃなくていろんな行動学習の要素をセロトニンがあの
制御してるんじゃないかということをあの提案して検証を進めようとしているところです。でこういった教育学習ではですねその報酬というものを手がかりにして、まあ、行動をするわけですね。でまああのー動物だったら餌とか水、まあ、人間だったらお金、まあ、企業だったら収益かもしれないですけども最近はただ単にあの収益だけを求めるんじゃなくて SDGs とかいろんなものを考えなきゃいけなくなってくるわけですね。でそういった報酬というものをどう設定するのかあるいはその生物でどういうふうにできてきたのかというのは非常にまあ面白いあの話題。テーマなわけですねであの、まあ、僕らはじゃあそのロボットが自分自身の報酬というものを獲得できるかどうかということを考えてきたわけですね。でやっぱり人間や動物の報酬というのはあの生存とあの繁殖ということに非常に関わっているわけですね。でこれはロボットバッテリーを充で突っ込まれることで自己保存をして今この2台のロボットは赤外線通信でお互いのプログラムのパラメータをコピーし合ってるわけですけどもこういった形でソフト的な自己複製ができるようなシステムを作ってそれ何ができるかということを見ていったわけですね。でこういったあのロボットの上に、まあ、あの人工的な進化のシステムを作ってやるとですね例えばそのバッテリーを見た時にそれをどれくらい報酬として感じるかとかですね他ののロボットの顔を見た時にそれをどれくらい報酬として自分の行動を学習するかといったようなことがですね進化の結果としてあの形成されてくるということが分かってきたわけですそういう形でまあ進化計算と教科学習を組み合わせることでより自律的に自分自身の目的を見つけるようなそういったシステムを作ることができることを明らかにしたわけですまあそういったあのことをやっていくとですねまあいろんなあの多様性みたいなものができてくるということもまあ分かりましたでまあ最近はあのこのロボット古くなってしまったのですねであのスマホをベースにしたロボットというのを作っていて、まあ、これはそのスマホの中の加速度センサーを使ってバランスを取るという行動をしてるんですけども、まあ、同様に、えー、充電ステーションに行って充電することで自己保存をしたりですねあの自己複製は w i f i とかを使ってもいいんですがこのロボットではあの QR コードに自分の遺伝子情報を示してそれを相手にコピーしてやると例えばこうやってバランスする行動が、えー、伝わるみたいですねそういったようなことをやっています。まあ、そういういなことを使ってですねあのより自律的にですねあの自分の学習自分で学習するさらに学習の仕方を学習するようなそういったロボットを作ろうということを進めていますであのこういった形でですねあの AI エージェントがより自律的になってくるということはまあ非常にあの僕はすごいことだと思うんですけども、まあ、それが問題じゃないかという心配に思う人も当然いるわけですねでその AI が自分の目標を発見することができるようになるとですね、まあ、それによって新しい科学とか技術とか文化産業などを作ってくるという可能性もあるんだけども、まあ、それがあの誤動作した場合にどういう副作用があるのかとあるいはその誰かあの敵意や悪意を持った人がそれを悪用した場合にどうなるかということはまあ非常に真剣に考えなきゃいけない問題だろうと思っています。まあ、そういったことを考える上でやっぱり重要なのは、まあ、人間社会に学ぶということなんじゃなくて思うんですね、まあ、AI も怖いかもしれないけど人間自身も非常にまあ怖い生き物なわけですね。あのまあ、これまであのお互いにあの傷つけあったり、まあ、人類自身も破滅の淵まで何度もあの立ってきているわけですね。であのそういったことでありつつもなんとかこの我々の社会が存続しているというのはそういった危険性を抑える仕組みが歴史の中からだんだん学ば、ま、れてきたと。民主主義というのは、まあ、単に理想というだけじゃなくて、まあ、特定の個人や集団に権力を集中させると必ず良くないことが起こるのでそれをどうにか防ぐ,防ぐということで、まあ、三権分立とか、まあ、独占禁止法とかいろんな仕組みができてきるわけですね、まあ、そういったようなものをこれから AI と人間が共存していく社会でもおそ,おそらく実現する必要があるだろうとで、まあ、例えば複数のオープンソースの AI エージェントが相互関係しながら、えー、世の中を動かしていくというそういったような仕組みをこれから作っていく必要があるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています。でということで、あのーまあ、割とあの基礎研究的なテーマで、まあ、人工知能や脳科学の研究をしてきているんですけどもこういったのもあの経験が、まあ、いろんなところに世の中に生かせればいいなということは思っています。まあ、そのディープラーニングというものはあの最近その大量の言語データを使うことで、えー、あの賢そうに見えるあのプログラムができていますけどもやっぱりそのロボットを動かすような物理世界で動くあるいはその人の、えー、心社会の仕組みを理解するところはまだまだこれからだろうと思うんですね。
で例えば僕らの研究室ではこういったあのロボット制御にですね、まあ、あのモデルベースと言ってますけどもあの自分の体がどうあの動くのかっていうことを、えー、モデルを作ってシミュレーションをしながらやることでよりあの効率よい学習ができるというようなことをあの示していますし、まあ、こんなものはこれから、えー、今このアルゴリズムをオープンソース化して世の中に普及させようとしてるんですがいろんな分野で活動できるんじゃないかというふうに思っています。であとあの、まあ、教科学習というのはあの、まあ、さっき言ったようなあのパラメーター制御とうまく組み合わせることでいろんな分野で活用できるようになりますしまた逆教科学習といってです、ね、その普通の教科学習のは逆にあの行動を見ながらこの人が何を目指しているかということを推定するというそういったアルゴリズムがあるんですね。まあ、そういうところを使うと、熟達者の行動データからそのコツを抽出するみたいな形で応用が効くんじゃないかということで、これはいくつかの企業との共同研究もこれまでも進めてきています。またあの先ほどの,あのうまく学習しないロボットみたいなものはですねその本当はうまく設計されたシステムが何かの表紙にうまく動かないということが病気とかのモデルになれるんじゃないかというかですねで、まあ、あれは一種のうつ病のモデルだと僕らは思ってるんですけども、まあ、最近得られているいろんなビッグデータとかですねそのウェアラルデバイスからとのデータを使って、えー、その原因を探るというようなあの研究もあの今あの企業との共同研究を開始しているところですまたその人の意思決定がどういうふうに行われるかということに関してやっぱりその直感的に決める部分とこの外界のモデルを使って、まあ、論理的な思考によって決定するというその両方が必要なわけですね。でそれがどういうふうに行われているかということに関して、まあ、僕らもこれまで脳科学的な研究を進めてきて。いまして。そうですね、あの脳の中の特定の回路が、えーまあ、直感的なあの意思決定とか、えー、より先読みをするような意思決定に変わっているということがあの示されてきます。こういったものを、えー、知見を活用してですねその、えーまあ、消費者あの顧客が、えー、どういうふうにあの選択をしているのかより良い選択をするするためにしてもらうためにはどういう提示の仕方が必要なのかということを考えられることもこれから面白い研究共同研究になるかなというふうに思っています。はい。ちょっと時間が伸びましたけれども、あのこの来月ですね、あの沖縄で神経科学と神経爆学より臨床系と神経回路学会というまあ応用系の学会の共同のあの学会をホストする予定でいますので、あの。これオンライン現地とハイブリッドですので興味がある方はぜひご参加いただければと思いますどうもご清聴ありがとうございました では、どうやさんについて、今日あの夜のテーマが AI アンドロボティクスということで,です、ねあのえーと、沖縄であの私のショーケースのお話,あの話をです、ね、おおあの聞いた方、あの時はですね、えー、と廊下の話の、廊下の生物学の話をしたんですね、えー、と今日はちょっとトピックがありまして、AI と人工知能、の AI とロボットの話をしたいと思います。で、まずその AI のフロンティアとか流れの話をです、ね、かいつまんちょっとしたいと思いますが、AI って結構ゲームとかですね、そういうので進んできたりした分野で、でさらに、えー、と有名なのがその IBM のディープブルーが1997年にカスパルフに勝ったっていう有名なチェスの,あのチャレンジがありますけど、えー、とチェスがあって将棋があって、えー、とこの前あのデ,ィープあのディープマインドが。えー、アルファ5で、えー、5の世界チャンピオンに勝ちましたねで、これは完全情報問題って言って、すべての情報が目の前にあるで、これをどう解くかっていうふうな問題なんですね、でえー、と状態の数も有限です、非常に大きいけど有限ですで、これに関しては、我々はほぼ解き方が分かったというふうに考えています
で次に今のチャレンジが実世界問題実物,実,実物異世界問題というかフィジカルリアルワールドの問題で、えー、例えばダーパのグランチャレンジの自動走行であるとか私があのスタートしたあのサッカーで世界チャンピオンのロボットを作るというあの、まあ、FIFA のワールドカップのチャンピオンに勝つロボットを作るという遠大なことをやっているんですけどこういうあのサッカーみたいなものとか、まあ、こういうところが今のフロンティアですでそれちょっとその最新のやつをちょっとあのご覧いただきたいと思うんですがこれはあのグランツーリズムを変えるプレイステーションのゲームが、まあ、あります。でこれがものすごく物理的にリアルな,あなんですね、ほとんどそのタ,イのタイヤの摩耗であるとか、えー、と空力とか全部あります、でこの白がです、ね、人間のトッププレイヤーです、えー、と世界チャンピオンとあのトップ10のうちの4人に来てもらって、えー、とこのグリーンにやってるとか、色がついてるのが、えー、と人工知能のドライバーです、ですであのこういうです、ね、あの大会をやりまして、えー、と結果としてはあのソフィーって書いてあるソフィーっていうのは人工知能の名前全部あの人工知能が、まあ、そのワン・ツー・フィニッシュをするという,ような形ですの、ね、で、まあ、これが、まあ、あのっていうのが今の,その人工知能のフィジカルリアルワールドのフロンティアです。でもうこの後ろについてここからです、ね、オーバーテイクしていくんですね。で一番最後のところでこのコーナーのところをギリギリオーバーテイクしていくで。でここで来るのか、えー飛び込んできた入っていくという、まあ、か,なかなりかなりギリギリの,あのところを攻めていくだけどぶつかったらだめなんでぶつからないっていう、えー、とパフォーマンスとあのスポーツマンシップを両方とも満たさなきゃいけないっていうやつでこれ実はあの私あのソニーでも仕事してましてソニーのチームがやったやつで、えーとね、2月のネイチャーのです、ね、表紙を飾りましたでこれ暴力的な計算量が必要で、えー、と数千台のプレイステーションをガンガン回して、えー、学習させた結果がこれです。でこれがあの見てみるとです、ねえー、とそのコースの取り方が普通の教科書の取り方と違って、えー、とファス,、えー、とスローインファストアウトとかっていうふうに言うんでそうじゃなくてファストインファストアウトしてるとかですね<笑>あの後ろからギリギリのところにいたのになんであれであのスイップストリームの 0.3 秒後ぐらい走ってるんですねでレース見てる人だとそれを走れないっての大体分かってるんですけどなんでかっていうともうねドライバーのステアリング、えー、と実戦のところ黒い線があれが人間のステアリングです。であのガ,チガチガチになってるのがあれ AI ですあれだけ細かい制御をすればスリップストリームの中でも走れるんだってことが分かったんですねじゃ人間にはこれはできないということが分かりましたで,でこれがあのでそれ以外に例えばディープマインドは特膜原発あの核融合炉のプラズマ制御を AI で行うとかっていうこういうのがもう今のフロンティアなんですねでここさっきの,その審判を見るとチェスとかああいう完全情報ゲームからフィジカルリアワールドに来て一つはこう物理世界の非常に複雑なシステムをどういうふうにコントロールするかというところでこれはもうスーパーヒューマンパフォーマンスはもうできることが分かりましたあとはどれだけデータを取ってどれだけ計算するかの勝負ですでもう一つのフロンティアが今日お話しするサイエンティックディスカバリーでこれもっとオープンなスペースであって非常に難しい問題にオイストで私の研究室がチャレンジをしていきますで基本的には、えっと、複雑なシステムを理解し制御する科学と技術を作るというのが、まあ、大きなものですそれでライフサイエンスに関しては非常に大きなトランスフォーメーションが起きていてそれは何かというとこの8つの技術ですね AI とバイオフマティクスそれとロボティクスとナノテクノロジーレーザーオプティクスとジンエディティングメッセンジャー RNA セルラリープログラミングケミカルシンセスこの8つのテクノロジーの組み合わせで新しい革新が起きてます例えばこの、えー、と今5つの分野を組み合わせた革新というのが我々の認知を作ってくれたメッセンジャー RNA ワクチンです。でこれはそのあのペンユーペンの,あのカリコさん、ワイスマンのチームと,、えー、とファイザー・ビオンテックでビオンテックの方のチームとアメリカの方はモデルナの,あのベンチャーの,、えーとまあ、この,あ,のあれですよね、えー、とフロンティアあフ,ラフラッグシップフロンティアというあパイオニアという、まあ、あのスタートアップのベンチャーのチームがやったわけですけど、まあ、こういうのができていますで、えー、とじ,ゃあじゃあそれを使って何をやるかというと私の今の考えは科学研究サイエンスセリフディスカバリーというのはプリインダーインダストリアリボリューションだというふうに思っていますなぜかというと非常に大きなデータをシステマティックに取ることができるようになってきましたでもそのデータを見て我々はこれ何なんだろうって考えてるんですよでそれで運がいいといいとがいい仮説が思いつくとそこでうまくいくだけど思いつかないとうまくいかないでここのところはもう結構オプチュニスティックなんですねでこれをシステマティックに大量に発見がし続けるようにしたいというのがチャレンジです
でこれあの実際にそれをですねじゃあどうなんだっていうのなんですけど山中先生の IPS とあと白川先生の,あのコンタクティングポリマーのところのですね全部であの論文とかですねあの本とか、えー、インタビューとか見ましてと基本的にすごくシンプリファイすると「サーチオプティマイゼーション」なんです山中先生の場合ちょっとすると24つのですね遺伝子っていうのをあの理研のプロジェクトのファントムデータベースからサーチして大体これだっていうのは分かって実際それでリプログラムするのは分かってそれからディーブ・アン・ワート・エクスペリメントっていうのをやって4つでいいっていうのが分かってこれがノーベル賞に行ってますでこれちょっとかなり簡略化してますけど基本的には探索と最適化でかなり多くの全てとは言いませんがかなり多くの科学的な発見はこのプロセスを通ってるということをですねだんだん分かってきましたでそうするとそれを実際に自動的にやるようなプロセスを作っていこうということでいろんなデータとか文献から知識を抽出してそこから仮説を生成して自動的に実験のプロトコルを生成して実験してそれをまた知識に加えるというループを高速で回すということがチャレンジになりますで我々が今までやってきたことというのは例えばこれは、えっと、論文から、えっと、知識を取り出すということなんですが例えばそれ取り出した知識はこれですねこれはあのコロナに関係するやつなんですが非常に膨大な知識が出てきますでこれが、えっと、がんに関係する、えっと、シグナル伝達系のところで、えっと、白が人間で全部抽出したやつで,でグリーンが、えっと、機械が自動的にやったやつで大体 95% 抽出することができましたでさらにその抽出した中で人間が発見してない知識があるということに我々が気が付きましたでそれで一つの実験としていくつかの病気と化学物質との関係というのが見つかった年がちょっと古めのデータ使いましたけどその前の年までの論文で、えー、と実際の関係性が予測できるかということをやってみると Q y マイナス1ってところなんですけど 98% が 95% が非常に信頼度が高く予測できましたで10年前になったらどうなるかというとごく一部のところはですね、えー、とここら辺は10年前でも 74% の信頼度ただいくつかは5年前でも全然予測できないのもありますだ,だからこれをうまく使っていくと数年前ものによっては数年前に高信頼度の予測ができるのでこれを検証する実験系を回すことによってスピードアップすることができるだろうというふうに考えていますで例えばあの川岡先生と一緒にやったそのインフルエンザのプロジェクトがあるんですがでこれは先ほどの知識抽出をも使いながら、えっと、インフルエンザのウイルスの増殖の分子間相互作用の我々が知っている全ての知識というのを全部抽出をしてきました。でこれあの非常にあの詳細なので実はヨーロッパで始まったコロナに対する薬とかワクチンを作るというプロジェクトのこれがベースになりましてでこの上に例えばサノフィーであるとかそういう製薬会社が関わるさらにヨーロッパの研究チームがこれをコロナに向けてさらに充実させるというプロジェクトが立ち上がって、まあ、今でもこう続いてるんですがあの、まあ、かなりその基礎科学としては役に立ったんじゃないかと。でこういうことが出てくるとこのネットワークのどこをターゲットにすれば結果があの変,変化が大きいのかっていうのが分かります。これは AI とかよりもかんあの非常にリジットな制御工学と数理のグラフ理論を使ってそれを決めていきます。であの赤のところがここがターゲットあそ,あそこをターゲットにすると、えー、ウイルスの複製というのが効果的に止められるというふうないくつかのポイントがこれ数理的にも決まってきます。でそれと実際の実験のデータを合わせることによって、えー、とどこのポイントっていうのがターゲットになるなってます。ただこれ一個には絞れません。で、えー、ですのでこれからです、ね、何をやっかというと我々はいろいろな化合物のライブラリーがあるのでそれとあそこにあるタンパク質がどういうふう一番その結合性の高い組み合わせは何があるかということでシミュレーションでやりましたで我々はその機械学習を使ってあのドッキングシミュレーションをやったんですが要するにそのタンパク質があって化合物があった時にどの化合物を使うとターゲットになるタンパク質の活動を抑制できるかということを実験すると高いので実験じゃなくてどれだけ計算でできるかということでやりましたでそのための計算がをするあのメカニズムドッキングシミュレーションってあるんですが市販のものがゴールドってやつなんですがなかなかですね精度が出てなかったんですねで我々はそれを機械学習で非常に高精度なシステムを作ることにまあ成功しましたでそれと、えー、で全部計算したのはこれですだ先ほど出てた図の中のタンパク質を全部取り出して構造が上がってる全部取り出してそれから何百万もある化合物のライバリーと全体全の計算をしたのがこのヒートマップって我々呼んでますマップです。でこれが全てですねあ,のある化合物とこの,あのタンパク質のターゲットになるものの、えーまあ、バインディングアフィニティって我々呼んでますけどどのくらい結合して機能を阻害するとかあの
企業をあのアップレギュレーションというかです、ね、アクティブにするかどうかというのが、ここに全部計算されています。で、この時は、タンパク質は結晶構造で分かっているものしか使えなかったんですが、えー、と去年、ディープマインドがアルファフォールド2というです、ね、タンパク質の構造を非常に高精度に計算で、あの深層学習で予測できるアルゴリズムを開発しまして、今、すべてのタンパク質に対する高精度な構造予測ができます。で、これと我々のアルゴリズムをつけることによって、えー、とすべてのタンパク質に対して、すべての化合物の,、えーままあ、あの対応ですね、それとネットワークの構造が分かりますから、何かをターゲットしたときに、ネットワーク全体としてどういう動きが出るかというのが、理論上、計算可能になってくると思います。で、この時のプロジェクトは、まあ、あのアルファボルト前ですから、限定でしたけど、それでもいくつかの化合物が見つかって、それが今、あの前輪賞で、えー、マウスと、あとモンキーですね、非常にいい成績で出てます。ですので、今回はコロナですが、インフルエンザ、鳥インフルエンザのパンデミックのときには、この薬が使えるかもしれません。えー、ですねでこれをやってくるとです、ね、さらにこれからなんですが、実験を自動化する必要があります、非常に多くの実験をする必要が出てきますので、これはあの実験のです、ねえー、とデータのフローであるとか、物理的な人、またはロボットの動きのフローであるとか、えー、とマテリアルですね、実験資材、試薬の動き、えー、などをちゃんと管理するという、まあ、ソフトウェアというのを、まあ、作る必要があるので、それをまあ開発をしています。それと,、えー、と、実際にロボットですね、オイス今、マホロありますけど、我々のところはマホロも使いますが、コボタという、まあ、これに限らないんですけど、小型のやつですね、大体200万ぐらい。でマホロは大体7000万ぐらいしますでコボタのちっちゃいやつをたくさん使うことによって、非常にアフォーダブルで、えー、全工程を自動化するというチャレンジをしていきたいというふうに考えたで、これが出てくると、今度はデータをどういうふうにセキュアに機械学習するかというのが重要になってきます、でこれはオイストので、まあ、パテントを取ったやつなんですが、えー、とこのあの医療関係の方はご存知と思いますが、基本的に、えー、と連結不可能匿名化データというのを使うんですね、でそうすると、連結不可能匿名化というのは、元のデータが誰かというのがもう分からないようになっていますでそれを機械学習させたりとか分析するんですがその時にこの人は危ないよっていうのが分かった時にもう連結できないんで誰だか分かんなくなってるんです。でそれは普通は前提としては論文で発表して、それをあの医者さんが読んで、次の治療っていうことなんですが、もうウェアラブの時代ですから、リアルタイムにフィードバックしたいわけですよ。で、それは今までのセキュ,アセキュリティメカニズムではできないので、われわれが開発したのは、連結不可能匿名化データであっても、だハ,イリスクグルハイリスクの患者が分かれば、マスターのデータベースでは、それが実は誰だったかというのは、セキュリティ上の問題なく再現することができるというアルゴリズムを考えました。で数学的には2つののアイソモルフィックな空間上のプロジェクトリーの総動性というのを保証するというアルゴリズムにまあなります。あのそういうのはできました。でこれらをつなげることによって新しいプロジェクトはできますが、その最初の一つのあの最初のプロジェクトとしてマンタプロジェクトというのをこのまアナウンスしました。これはえっ、ー、と何かというとえっ、ー、とあれですねあのあのマイクロバイオーム、えー、腸内細菌まあ航空内もやりますがマイクロバイオームとヒューマンマルチオミックスとライフスタイルの組み合わせで、えー、疾病予測であるとか治療方法を考えるということでこれなぜかこれを始めたかというと、マイクロバイオームってものすごい数あるんですよ、人によっても違う、地域も違う、それと人のオミックスっていうのも一言に全部違う、それとライフスタイルも違う、食べるものも違う、そうすると一番組み合わせが多いライフサイエンス上の医療上の問題はこれなんです、でまずこれを解きに行こうということで、えー、やります、でもちろんそのマイクロバイオームというのは、体のいろんなところに影響がありますし、えーとまあ、脳の問題もあのあの、パーキンソンとかもそれが原因だっていうの分かってきます、多分アルツハイマーとかディメンシアもかなり影響があると思いますし、あと老化、一般に非常に大きな影響がありますし、免疫系にも影響があることが分かっています。ですので、この関係性を解くということが非常に大きな問題で、一番組み合わせが難しいので、これを自動的に AI を使ってやっていくチャレンジを行うと、これができてくると、この間、この周りでたくさんいろんなスピンアウトが出てきまして、非常に大きな規模のスピンアウトが出てくることます。で、これであの私がやりたいのはオイストに、まあ、ムーンショットエコシステムというのを作ろうというふうに考えています。のであのご賛同いいただければという,ふうに思いますしえー、といろいろ出資をしていただければ、面白いことが起きるんじゃないかと思いますので、えー、<笑>なので、えー、あれですね、バイアワオイストっていう感じだと思いますけど、はい、ありがとうございました。Thank you. Well, with Kitano san, my God, you start from a video game and then you go into something that I didn't understand. And then you go to the moonshot.、Um, and、um, also, congratulations to the translator.、Um, this is,、uh, you know, world record speed.
you know, absolutely, um, absolutely fantastic, and, and we're actually ahead of time. And I don't want to steal from the thunder some questions from the audience, you know, for um, either the research efforts that were presented or, you know, any personal questions or any questions about OIST and the research environment. Uh, anybody, any questions? James, I'm going to pick on you. in the world, in many universities. Um, but I would like to ask you, what makes OIST so special? I think it has, uh, you know, OIST is a very special place because like, we built from the scratch. And therefore, we can create a culture. And it's very open, and it's global. And we can actually make a very uh, uh, quick strategic decision. And particularly, I know, under uh, Peter's leadership, I think we can make a very quick strategic decision. I think that distinguishes from other institutions, particularly uh, other Japanese uh, universities. I mean, they are probably a president of university. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think they're making effort, you know. <laughs> uh, and particularly, like, uh, I actually started getting about OIST from 2000, when there's nothing. And uh, after uh, Minister Omi decides, I think I'm the uh, a person which has the longest history of involvement in OIST, I guess. And, and let me tell you, when we start on OIST, many professors, very distinct professors, said, Kitano san, you are wasting time this, because this is not going to happen. Mm. You know, this is stupid. You know, Okinawa, best university in the world? Give me a break. That was the reaction. Now you see, OK, so like OIST has a track record making impossible possible. So, you know, first, ten de first decade, that happens. Second decade, will repeat that legacy. And that's why I'm committing to OIS. Toya-sensei. Yes, yes. あの、今その時はこんなの同性建物 あの、で、チャレンジャーな人はこういう危ない話は手出さない。そういうところに手出す人が新しいことやるから、そのフィルターがあるってのはいいところだと思う。そうですね。はい、thank you. Any other individual data from about 40 million people. That's cool. But my understanding is that it's very, very difficult to use. Um, what recommendations would you make? Say you had one minute with the prime minister. What would you tell him to order the Ministry of Health and Welfare to do in order to make this more useful for the health of the Japanese people and the people of the world? Well, 
I, I, I don't know if a prime minister is the best person, but I think I got, you know, for that data, actually, there are some startup companies who start making use of it. For example, like a Minakea, which is by Yuji Yamamoto, and then uh, there are um, uh, you know, numbers of companies who actually uh, get agreement with the healthcare uh, unions to make use. So I think uh, you know some of the early success would probably amplify. At the same time, I think we can have an opt-in kind of a new kind of like a, a more advanced healthcare uh, service. Uh, we, we can probably start from the Abamanta project because we they got you know microbiome that is complete outside of the conventional uh, you know health health medical checkup. So I think we can actually do something new. And if we apply for like a, if it is a prime minister, let's make a OIST uh, designated special area allow us to do you know a new kind of a, a medical service, our like a, you know insurance uh, service uh, based on the uh, data we get. You know, that, that could be the case. And then, uh, by the way, I think like Minake, uh, if he agrees, uh, if I must agree, we can actually invite him to be on OIST. His company, you know, so they don't get his company to the OIST, I think. <laughs> まあ、あのこれは北野さんの専門ですけども、やっぱりそれをやるときに、あの国民のなんかなんか再意識みたいなものをどうあの防ぐかなるべくオープンにまあしかもそれぞれの人にとってあの効果が実感できるような形で活用していくというところが合意を取るために一番必要じゃないかなというふうに思います。Great, fantastic.、Um, thank you very very much, Doya 先生、北野先生、and you've given us a nice entree to the next panel.、Um, you've Had a little bit of a glimpse、um, into the excellence and the dynamism and the challenge session, the challenger spirit <laughs> that the OIST professors have. And we would like now to move on to the next panel and、uh, to look a little bit at the、uh, step. How do we get from research towards、um, proof of concept, towards businesses? Towards innovation and ultimately economic development. So, Kitano Sensei, Doya Sensei, if you could please leave the stage. Thank you. And if I may call onto the stage, please,、uh, James Higa,、uh, Kenji Kovair, Jennifer Rogert, and、uh, Gil. So while they're moving onto the stage, so while they're moving onto the stage, I want to very quickly,、um, I want to very quickly just cast a little bit of the net because yes, OIST, the number one mission is excellence in research, but it doesn't stop there. It goes: How do we get from deep research? How do we get from science towards economic development? And of course. OIST is located in Okinawa. Look at the facts. If you look at the、um, you know, per capita income, Okinawa is the poorest part of Japan. And it is actually very sad. We've just had the 50th anniversary、uh, when Okinawa returned to Japan. But actually, you find that the kaksa, that the gap between Okinawa and the rest of Japan, has not closed. Has actually widened a little bit further. So, all the money that has been put, you know, lots of baramaki, very nice roads, great traffic lights, excellent dams, but not much impact in terms of sustainable, recurring economic development. And this is where OIST comes in. We've got the basis now after 10 years with excellent science. How do you get to sustainable economic development? And no, it is not about another supplementary budget. It is not about more money being thrown to build another bridge that leads to nowhere. <laughs> The consistent evidence if you want sustainable economic growth, you need to raise the number of entrepreneurs. In your society, in your region, 
This is some long range data. And you see that if the share of entrepreneurs goes up by one percentage point of the population, the Sensei Seichoritsu, the potential growth rate, goes up by about half a percentage point, which in Japan's case would be huge, given that the potential growth rate is about half a percent. So it's very clear we know what we, knew, what we need to do. And by the way, if you don't like economic analysis, look at the facts again. If you look at job creation, it is the young companies. It is companies younger than 10 years old that create all the jobs. The dinosaurs destroy jobs. So it's very interesting. This is true in the US. This is true in Germany. This is true in Israel. And yes, this is true in Japan as well. So it's interesting. What we want is very clear. We know what we need to do, a healthy innovation ecosystem. And OIST can make this happen for Okinawa, for Japan, for Asia, and for the world. Now, having said this, now let's move to the panel. And I'm going to moderate a little bit from here. And I thought it'd be nice to start out with a country that is doing a very good job. Because you see, America, whatever you think of America, America is actually doing a fantastic job of unleashing innovation, of transforming innovation into concrete businesses. And James Higa, we're very honored to have you here tonight. James is, um, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about yourself and then uh, about your experiences in the United States and what we can learn at OIST from that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'll start with a little bit about myself. Uh, all my life I've been going across the Pacific and back again. I was actually born in Indiana. My parents were studying abroad there. We came back to Okinawa when I was two. I was in regular Japanese elementary school till I was about eight. We sold everything, went back to the States so I could grow up to be a native English speaker. Came back to Okinawa to finish high school uh, at Kubasaki High School and then applied and was accepted at Stanford. And that's how I ended up in the middle of Silicon Valley and after graduating, joining a company with a funny looking rainbow logo called <laughs> Apple. And that is where I met my longtime colleague and my friend, uh, Steve Jobs, who hired me into the Macintosh group. And it was a nearly 30 year journey. I reported to Steve most of my career. Uh, amazing privilege to be able to work with him and work with the teams on the most iconic products of our generation the Macintosh computer, iPod, iTunes, iPhone, etc. But also along the way, not just Apple, I was able to see companies start and grow like Cisco, like Sun Microsystems, like Yahoo, like Google. And I want to take those companies as an illustration of why I believe basic research, why I believe universities are such an important part of the ecosystem. For Cisco, it was actually my freshman dorm mate who wrote much of the original code in their original router product. He was a real quiet engineer. We had no idea what he was doing, except we knew he was in front of a computer. Turned out he was one of the early employees at Cisco. Some microsystems happened because there were so many different computers from so many different manufacturers on the Stanford campus that they couldn't communicate or talk with each other. And so they needed to develop something. The sun in some microsystems stands for Stanford University Network, not the sun that we're <laughs> orbiting around. Uh, Yahoo was started by Jerry Yang uh, in his dorm room because he wanted a directory for the internet. You all know the story of Sergey Brin and Larry Page and their founding Google. Uh, from Stanford as well. So I've seen directly that the creation of new knowledge is the driving force of Silicon Valley. And the creation of new knowledge equals the creation of new entrepreneurs. The other thing I think that's really important about 
this relationship between university and industry is that in Silicon Valley and at Stanford, we had a very, very open atmosphere, very transparent, permeable walls between academia, the university, and industry. As an example, I was asked to co-teach a D school, design school class, uh, along with Professor Terry Winograd, who happens to be the graduate advisor for Sergey Brin and Larry Page. Now, I did that with, I don't have a teaching credential. I am not a professor. We didn't sign a contract. I was not paid. There was no NDA. They just took all the barriers away to be able to do this. And it was freely welcome. When I was at Apple and we wanted to really start pioneering wireless communication, what did I do? I called up President Hennessy at the time and said, can you introduce me to someone who might know something about this? He called a former graduate student of his. Two days later, I'm sitting in front of one of the top world's experts in wireless Wi-Fi hardware and custom chips. And that kind of open door between industry and academia also has a gigantic part. Uh, and because I've seen this with my eyes, with my heart, and experienced it in my life is why I have such a strong conviction that the creation of new knowledge, basic research, universities, and OIS will have a vital part and a central role in the creation of an ecosystem, not just for Okinawa and Okinawan development, but for Japan as well to benefit humankind. Fantastic. Um, excellent um, openness, uh, reducing the barriers. Well, Japan is full of barriers. Tatewari Gyose, lots of silos, lots of people who don't talk each to each other, lots of rules. Um, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer is on the board of councillors, and uh, Jennifer has a long experience in Japan, and she serves on the board of, Jennifer, is it okay if I say this? Of Japanese dinosaurs. <laughs> um, she's on the board of Kawasaki, Kawasaki Juko, Mitsui Busan, and uh, most recently, um, what is this company called? Seven and I. Seven and I. And I skip over the Nissan board, but that's, um, you know. But demo, in all seriousness, I, like I mean, you challenge. know, starting something from afresh, which is what James talked about, is easy. Changing something that is established and proud is difficult. Jennifer, how does innovation happen, and what can OIS do to help uh, to teach old dogs new tricks? Well, thank you, Jesper. Um, so thank you, everyone. Yes, um, I joined my fourth board today. And I think what's interesting is I thought I would take a look at how we got here, what some of the issues are relative to some of these barriers, and how OIST can, can deliver some of the answers related to that. But I joined my first board in 2015. And at that time, um, the female representation on boards was 2%. That's already tripled. And I think today at 7 and I Holdings, there were three women, two foreigners, that were female, including myself, and then um, uh, four foreigners altogether. So I think that things are changing. And the reason I bring up diversity as such a key point is I think that, you know, that the bottom line is what is your catalyst for innovation and when do you know you need innovation? And for me, in, in Japan, you've had a lot of government involvement in trying to get Japan to change. You had Abenomics with the number of women. You also have had um, the um, stock exchange um, putting in the corporate governance code and saying we need more diversity on boards. And that really is essentially because it's still staggering to me that Japan still has the lowest productivity rate in all of the G7 countries. And the gap continues to widen. So what you're really talking about, I think, is that you're, you're, you're going to have to, to make a change. And what I think we all realize and what Japanese leaders have realized, a lot of this was external pressure about put more women on boards. Then the last change to the corporate governance code is you have to now have voluntary targets for nationalities and different levels at 
within the company. So there's still an increasing, I think, push. But a lot of that is because if you look at who are the top 20 companies in the 90s, I think Japanese banks dominated, et cetera, and now you don't have any Japanese companies up there with an Apple or a Google, et cetera. So I think there really is an economic necessity and a mindset. But the biggest thing I believe finally that's woken everybody up, got religion, is that there's now unequivocal research that innovation and diversity are linked. I really, there was a great phrase this morning by somebody that has got religion with a lot of the changes to the 7 and I Holdings Board, but he said, you know, diversity and inclusion now is a must in Japan, and that's because the opposite of that is uniformity and exclusion. And I think what you're really talking about is, you know, the catalyst for innovation has to be that openness, that diverse culture, that that awareness that other opinions should be taken into account to come up with a more, um, a, a more innovative outcome. And I think that you know when you look at the profitability, it, it's a no-brainer. I think one of the biggest barriers when we look at this, and I don't think Japanese companies have done this well, like a Google. You know, what is it? Uh, fail fast and small. I think is it. But you know, risk taking. Is part, part of diversity for me is, is about risk. Diversity is discomfort. Being with people of different backgrounds, different expertise is challenging. And I think what is true about Japan is while they realize that they need to innovate and it makes economic sense for their survival, they have two issues. They don't have a diverse culture yet that's going to bring around that quickly enough, right? And the second is just the speed. If I think about the car industry, thank you about Nissan, right? But if you look at some of the easier areas, when you think about the need for technology and the speed of development, you have this issue that you know there's so much disruption out there. The car industry in 10 years, nobody really knows. You're going to have autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. People think EVs will be there. But you're going to have to have so much technological innovation in batteries. It, it's, it's a bit of a moonshot in some ways. So I think that you know the reality is that Japanese leaders have woken up to the fact that, yes, we need to be competitive. We need the speed to be innovative. But there's still that. I think that barrier, that mentality, the preference has always been to do it internally through internal R&D. Some companies that I'm with, they have actually done some moon labs and things internally. But I think you still have this reticence to um, invest or take a risk on a startup. What you still see more of in the robotics area, et cetera, is more strategic joint ventures. It's still a known entity, maybe a, a past innovative entity like a Google or another company like a Sony for one of my companies when we're doing some um, technological development. So these are all positives. But I think what's really missing is that the, the risk taking and just the speed. And I think what we're seeing in Japan, I think with financial institutions here, is we're starting to get a lot more um, corporate VC, which has been really lacking in Japan. But you still don't have the number of startups that you need, or even the level of research universities that you need. And where I think um, you know Japanese leadership is really struggling is what is the right solution for that? And for me, I think one of the best things about OIS is it was pushed by the government and funded. When I think about diversity and a lot of the catalysts for change that's happening now, it's the it's the medis and the other people that are really worried about continued stagnation in Japan. So I think that when I look at what OIST has to deliver, it's government funded and backed. Obviously, there's challenges there still. But it's also incredibly diverse. Mm. And I think that Japan is dying for diversity. They really appreciate what it brings. But it's also a little bit difficult. And some companies have set up places in Silicon Valley. But for me, there's so little available in Japan mm. that is close and accessible. You can get on a plane and go face to face as yep. much as you want now that COVID is over. So I really think that the level of expertise now with the reputation that OIST has created for the last 10 years, with the diversity of research, the diversity of nationalities, I really think that corporate Japan is really opening up to those possibilities, right. but is just not aware of them. So for me, I'm quite optimistic that the value proposition that OIST has, and also I think we saw at the OIST 10th anniversary for our, our Nobel Prize speaker, our Nobel laureate speaker, that GDP 
and you know your research and basic science are inequivocally linked. You really can't have one without the other. So for me, when I look at the horizon in the future, even for Japanese companies, I do worry about speed still, and I do worry about how can you implant enough diversity quickly enough to create that innovation. That's where your startup ecosystem is critical, and your basic research feeding that, plus the incubation becomes so essential. And I really do think, Oist is well positioned for that and would love to be part of the solution. How can we try to bring that? I don't think dinosaurs. Forward thinking, but long past, a lot of the companies I'm on, it's more than 100 years, but forward thinking, um, large companies that want to be more nimble. Forward thinking, large companies, and Oist as a little jewel um, sparkling in Okinawa. So you're going to have to spread the word, right? Um, Kenji, uh, Kenji Govers um, has been, um, you know, very involved with Oist. Uh, I think you visited Oist uh, in the last year about 16 times or something like that. You, you single-handedly kept uh, JAL and ANA uh, in business. Um, but uh, Kenji, extremely knowledgeable um, about Japan. Uh, he runs the uh, consumer uh, uh, practice at uh, Bain, um, the consulting firm here, very influential, very impactful. Can you sort of a little bit, from your personal perspective, what does OIST bring to the table? What, has, uh, uh, what, what impresses you about OIST? So a couple of things that um, Jennifer said, and I would probably start by saying that, you know, something, hap something funny happened, actually, not funny, but 100 years ago, during the uh, Meiji Revolution, there was something uh, called the Haiyang Chikan which was basically the centralization towards Tokyo to build a country. And I believe we need the opposite. We need actually um, Haiken Chihang, <laughs> which is basically giving power back to the, to, not to the prefectures, to the region actually, right? And I think that's where OIST can show a perfect example about, you know, innovation will come from all different parts of Japan, actually, you know? And uh, as uh, Jennifer said, you know, because the alternative of non-diversification is basically just a single entity without too much, uh, you know, um, diversification. Uh, so that's the first thing. You know, the second thing that I believe uh, OST is actually quite um, exciting to, to look at is, um, and you just saw that with the presentation of, you know, of, uh, Professor Kitano and, and Doya. I mean, these are the key topics of the, of, of, of the day. You know, we talk about neuroscience, we talk about uh, microbiomes, you know, we just, I mean, these are, I mean, the topics of the day and OIS is working on them. You know, we're not talking about some kind of a random thing that, you know, which is good for some professor somewhere that receive government money. No, no actually, that's very, very relevant uh, for us. And, and um, I know time is limited, but, you know, I wanted to comment on a few things. Um, so obviously, you know, I, I hesitate to talk about entrepreneurship just next to uh, James Higa because, you know, <laughs> probably going to make myself you know, pretty stupid. But anyway, you know, it's okay. I'm old enough anyway to take this one. But actually, I'm, I'm on, actually I think that's actually ja uh, Japanese, uh, there are many entrepreneurs in Japan, actually, as a matter of fact. Um, I mean, just go to Shibuya. I mean, it's not very far from here. It's full of creativity, actually. Um, the problem is that, you know, people in Shibuya, they want to change Shibuya. People in Silicon Valley, they want to change the world. It's a different game, you know, it's a different game. And I think part of the job here are people involved in, in venture capital and ecosystem and everything, like Yamagishi uh, over there, good evening, uh, is actually to make uh, Japanese entrepreneurs uh, scalers. They want, you know, to, to scale things up. You know, I was in, a, in an event yesterday, it was about 18 startups presenting, you know, basically doing the five minute pitch about, you know, what the startup is wonderful. And I know, you know, why Combinator does this, you know, uh, for many, many years. And Jim has been probably through these kind of events like uh, a thousand times, I'm sure. And I have to tell you, I mean, it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. You know, very creative, you know, very energizing, you know, it was not, you know, it was not a board meeting, uh, you know, that sometimes I present to as a consultant, you know. <laughs> But yes, one of the issues that I was uh, struggling with is that you know, no one was talking about scale. Mm. They were talking about the little ideas, which is you know, super exciting. One of them was about manga, okay, fine. The other one was about, uh, I'm gonna convert you know, street art into NFT and I will do an auction house. The only thing that got interesting for me was actually the auction house. Mm. In the presentation, it was, that was the, the last slide. There was like 20 slides before about uh, you know, street art and NFTs and, and whatever. So I think you know, it's, 
uh, again, you know, I mean, think about Morita san uh, you know, so many decades ago, you know, taking his suitcase, going to New York and to sell transistors. Morita san was not an entrepreneur per se. He was actually a scaler because he wanted to sell transistors to the world. You know, so I think it's, it's, it's really the move from Shibuya to to the world, which is, and it's actually kind of happening, actually. It's kind of happening. I mean, the number of VCs have increased dramatically. There was about four or five VCs like five years ago. Now they're about 43, 45. You actually have people from private equity coming in, you know. Investment has doubled over the last few years. I mean, it's still very, very small. You know, it's still like, you know, one tenth or one twentieth of, of Europe. Not even Silicon Valley. I mean, you know, we, I don't think we should compare to Silicon Valley anymore, by the way. Sorry, uh, James. <laughs> because it's too far away. And actually, I think that we are, we're hurting ourselves in Japan to say Silicon Valley, because it's just too far away. Mm. Actually, we should actually compare ourselves to Israel. And I'm not saying this because you are here, Gail. It's because <laughs> they started Start of Nations a few decades ago now, super successful. You know, if Israel can do it, Japan can do it. Then France did the same, the French tech. I mean, come on, if French can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, you know, this was a little bit of a, of a tour de raison. Now, um, so what is OIST doing? Yes, yes, we do the research. Gil. Gil arrived at OIST about a year ago um, from Israel. Uh, he developed the best in class intellectual property system, management system, at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, absolute best in class. Gil, tell us a little bit about what exactly OIST is doing. Thank you, Jasper, and I really enjoyed the panel, um, and really inspirational. I just want to, so uh, best in class uh, technology transfer from Israel. I, I know, I'm not sure I'm going to sign on that, but I think Israel has the a lot of things that Japan is missing. By the way, the other way around. Uh, so Israel is extremely chaotic, extremely uh, not not organized, and we very very it's very very difficult for us to grow big businesses. And the Japan has all these kind of qualities. So I think. Um, at the Weizmann Institute, I didn't create. I was I inherited a, a wonderful infrastructure of uh, taking technologies from the basic research and building them forward. But what I really liked in OIST is the fact that this young university, amazingly, already had when I joined, and I, I have this slide for you, so I'm going to use it for you. <laughs> this amazing set of tools set up. And uh, I think I, I want to compliment the, you know, uh, the founders of OIST and all the management and the president of OIST for really building these tools in place. And uh, for us, it's really so powerful because then we, we, we have these tools to take everything from the basic research and push it forward. And all of us knows that basic research is great and it's really important, but it's far away from the industry. Any, any company that goes into uh, meeting with me and we seriously talk about uh, licensing, I always tell them, how long do you think it's going to be? And then they say five years, I say double, triple. It's, it's really, it's really, really, really difficult. It's quite a miracle that you, you can develop, but there are so many great innovations and so many great sci scientists that can push it forward, then eventually you, you can get, have it done. And it can fail along the way for many reasons. So we put in place a lot of things to try and mitigate the risk, to try and reduce the, the, the chances that it will fail. Eventually, what we also got to do now, and I'm very happy to kind of update you if you haven't heard it, so we, we created the fund. OIST Lifetime Venture Fund, which is another very important tool for us to actually boost what we're doing. And the fund is really giving us the perspective of the industry, a perspective of the investors, a kind of a reality check on everything we do. And the fund, and we have the partners here joining us here, and the fund is really part of what we want to do because that 
brings us to really understand uh, how our technologies uh, compared to the market, what, is, what should be our technologies, because the fundamental thing in, in basic science is that we create solutions to we don't know what. I mean, there are solutions. Now we need to, to find a problem to fit into that. Uh, and uh, having a fund near us and kind of working hand to hand with us is really an instrumental. So with a fund, we can really seed capital. We can bridge the gap and create a, really a capital for startups in Japan. We boost innovation. We do a lot of things that really support our ecosystem in Okinawa. And it's not a, a kind of a, a secret. We would like also to have some sort of a return on investment or our participation or, or to be partner, uh, to partner with the success. So I really resonate with what James said. We are very open. We, we, we are very open for the industry. We, we want to break the barriers as much as possible, keep the basic science in its, you know, safe environment to create innovation, but also collaborate very intensively with the industry. And uh, uh, we just, uh, again, love to partner with you guys. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, so I think you've seen all the various uh, ingredients are there. And the on-ramp to take off um, is actually being built and is now being made concrete with um, you know, a $50 million fund uh, which, by the way, uh, the $50 million haven't quite been raised yet, so very happy if you want to participate. There will be a very good return. Um, yes. Am I, can I say this? No. Okay, fine. <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> good. I think we've got time for one question um, you know, from, the, from the floor to anybody uh, on the podium. Hi, Dozo. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matt Chesson. I'm from the U.S. Embassy. Uh, and uh, as you know, we just had a bilateral summit between Japan and the United States and also a quad summit. Uh, to all the folks in Tokyo, sorry about the traffic and the helicopters for that. Uh, but my question is, uh, you know, Japan and the United States now have a, are probably the most important relationship internationally as far as technology cooperation. You've got this rising cooperation through the quad. What can the United States do to help support Japanese innovation? And what can the Quad partners do to help support each other's innovation in technology? For anyone. Gil? Convince Japan to create the NIH funding, government funding. Anybody else? Any pieces of advice? Is this on? No, this is. Um, I, I think one thing that can happen is certainly, I think the strength and advantage of the Western world, if you will, is in collaboration. And if you look at architecture, computational architecture, network architecture, everything is moving towards decentralization and open source. And that speaks to what you mentioned, which is don't try to do everything yourself. Mm. We have much more advantages and much more strength when we cooperate and work together. Um, so I would launch like a godzillion open source projects and somehow get Japanese companies to send every engineer to participate in every key open source project. Uh, and I think in that diversity that is present in that kind of atmosphere and that kind of environment is the inherent strength of innovation where not just Quad Alliance, but I think you know the, the, it, that's what we stand for: it's cognitive diversity, ideas, rule of law, cooperation, and collaboration. Jennifer, you do want to say something? Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, with the whole economic security legislation and the new theme on that, you know, I think there's not not a better time to sort of partner and start to really ramp up along those lines. I think OIST is a great international source of support. But I do think that when you think about the new alliances and the the geopolitics of, of Ukraine and China, et cetera, I think the, the Japan-US relationship is going to be more critical. Um, and I do think that Japan has looked for how the US has protected itself economically, but also is looking for, in the digital area in particular, you know, with a lot of the ongoing talks, those kind of 
um, synergy areas. So I think with a lot of even the specific areas of what OIST is doing, even in cybersecurity, some of that, I know there's been some issues on the government level that way. I just think there's a lot of partnerships that can be there, but also going for just the ongoing, I think, encouragement of the intellectual kind of capital exchange as well with some of these initiatives on open sourcing. And I think economic incentives are always appreciated, I think, to get, sometimes to get people to do the right thing, you have to provide the right, in <laughs> right incentives. So I think you know, any kind of government-related incentive uh, would be helpful. Kenji? Yeah, just picking up on uh, Jennifer's point on the incentives. So in my mind, you know, the last thing the Japanese government needs to do when it comes to uh, innovation is to be creative, in my mind. And what that means is that they just have to look at Israel and do the same thing, <laughs> copy-paste. I mean, don't, don't create anything new in Japan. Just do what Israel did. You copy-paste, you're, you're in good shape. You know, because actually, I mean, you, you guys did everything right. I mean, it was basically about, you know, uh, you know paying off uh, some of the R&D fees, you know, that's under certain conditions, making sure that, you know, when people fail and they get declare bankruptcy, you can still have actually a loan after that to actually start your second venture. France, did, you know, France actually did exactly the same thing by just looking at Israel, right? So again, it's, we don't have to be super creative. It's just like looking at what other countries did and succeeded, and that's it. Yep. Thank you very, very much. In the interest of time, um, a big round of applause for the panelists. Um, Kenji, James, Jennifer, Gil, thank you so much. And if I can now move on to the next panel, Peter and uh, Kanayama-san, if you could please come up on the, onto the stage. Um, we've had the science, we've had the hokosei, we've got the direction to get from science to entrepreneurship. Um, we now want to highlight about the future of innovation and an innovation hub that can exist right around OIST. Peter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jesper. Thank all of you, and in particular, thank all those that praised OIST so highly. And you may wonder, why do we succeed in getting talent like Kitano-san, like uh, Kenji Doya? Why are those people coming to OIST? And this is uh, the essence uh, of my talk, summarized literally in this slide. Because that gives you the criteria, the key criteria that make up OIST. And you can see here on top, the operational principles, they resemble a Western university. We have sitting here, Jerry Murray, the chair of our board of uh, governors, James Heger, the co-chair of uh, our Board of Governors. What that indicates is that we have a fully independent control mechanism of the management. So literally, the president reports to the board. The board is like an industry, an independent body, and the president literally follows the long-term strategy that is developed in the board. That's key, because in many Japanese universities, you have a mix of management and supervision. That never works. The next point is, obviously, the official language is English. If you want to make an international university, you better speak the lingua franca, which is in the, the sciences, is English. The international and cross-disciplinary, uh, and we heard uh, from Jennifer just a minute ago about diversity. Well, we have about uh, 60, 65% of our professors that are non-Japanese, and close to 80% of our students are non-Japanese. So we can attract the best of the best. You can see a highly competitive faculty recruitment and also student recruitment. Two years ago or so, we had 1,400 applications and we took 18 professors, nine per year. That was 
what we were allowed to take. So you can see the stringency with which we can pick the top talent. Students very similar. I uh, indicated that. The students about 500 per year. Uh, this year, about 1,000 in the pre-COVID. We take 50. And the best of the best in the, in, the, in the student body, they are getting a stipend because we want to support them. We want to make sure that they can f spend their full time on the research at OIST. Look at the student to faculty ratio. On average, one to three. So you can see how intensive the training of the students is. But the one single most important element for getting the best PIs from around the globe to come to Okinawa is referred here to as high trust funding. This is the secret of success, because what it allows you to do, or the PI to do, is you get five year worth of allotments of fully funding, fully funding of the research you do and you do not need to follow mainstream. And by necessity, if you try to write an application for a grant, you got to write in mainstream because otherwise it's not going to be funded. Your peers will turn you down, telling you that this is a much too risky project. We are committed uh, to sustainable economic uh, development, uh, growth, uh, speed, energy. Now let me show you some of the data um, that uh, um, underscore what I have just said. This has been published by um, the journal Nature. And you can see here that has been, I think it was from uh, 2019. And 2019, um, by looking at the most highly cited papers, OIST ranked number one in Japan and number nine in the world. And last year, it ranked even higher, um, demonstrating that the people we hire are the people that are publishing in the best. They are cited the most and hence have the greatest impact in both science and in the technology transfer. Right, these are the benefits that uh, OIST brings to uh, Okinawa and Japan. Cutting edge uh, science and technology, fostering the next generation. I can tell you that our students actually go to the best places around the globe. And lo and behold, and this is the latest uh, statistics that I have just uh, uh, seen last week, the single most successful recipient countries of our graduate student is Japan. So if you invest, mm. the foreigners stay. The foreigners stay in Japan if they get a job in Japan. If they are good, they will get a job in Japan. But in terms of uh, Keisai Doyukai and Kei Danren, uh, I do believe uh, it would not hurt if the companies would do a little bit of PR at OIST. <laughs> and it's worth of your uh, you know, communicators coming down. They can, if they want it, uh, to uh, you know, at least go swimming over the weekend, but give one talk at OIST. <laughs> so in any case, uh, these are our pillars. So the pillars are research, education through research. We only have graduate students, no undergrads. So in other words, these students learn by doing the research in the laboratory. And the last point is innovation. Gil has already indicated this. Uh, there are some areas which we are currently investing heavily. I don't want to go through this, but I can, of course, if the discussion time allows it, I can, uh, I can uh, allude to this. Um, but that is what I think drives OIST and what OIST's uh, task and mission will be in the years to come. So far, I've looked backwards. Now let's look forward. What can OIST do for Okinawa? 
Well, it's an intellectual driver and a partner of choice for innovation in Okina Okinawa, promoting economic growth and addressing problems important to Japanese and global society. This is where we want to do that. And what we have so far is this one. This is where OIST is located. And what you can see here, this is our campus. This is a very small incubator that is full 500 square meters. And this is a 100 hectare area that is available and could be developed into an innovation park with a major goal to attract startups, but also existing companies. And towards this end, we've had many discussions with a group that is referred to as ULI, Urban Land Institute. And I'm very happy to have Kanayama-san, who is a director at the Urban Land Institute, with us tonight. And maybe, Kanayama-san, you can talk, tell, tell us a little bit about the forward look and what ULI would advise OIS to, go, uh, to do in the sense of building up an innovation park. Thank you very much. あ、こんばんは。こんばんは。東急の金山でございます。あの、東急って東急株式会社という名前で2年前からあの、名称変わった会社でございます。で、今日、あの、沖縄は1972年から進出しました。1972年があの、返還なんで相当パイオニアでま、あの、本土の、ま、大手企業の中では1年早く沖縄に出てきたというところです。ま、その後、ま、ホテルを中心に開発を進めてきてい
ユニークなクオリティーライフがある場所だなというふうな感じがしてます、えっとまあ、渋谷はもちろんそういう部分でユニークなエンバイロメントを作ろうとてやってきてるんですがやはりそういうものはイノベーションは大事な要素かなというところにつながるものだと思ってますで次ですね、えー、タレント・オールウェイズ・マレスって書いてありますこれなかなか難しいと思うんですが僕は PhD のまあ数だとか、まあ、あとそういうプロフェッショナル集積ということだと思うんですけれども、まあ、とにかく人がいなきゃ話人というのはすみませんタレント非常に難しいところですけれどもタレンティーな人が必要だというところがほぼこういうライフサイエンスクラスターには重要だというようなこれエビデンスというところになります。それでですね、実はあの私は実は1年半前まで大石さんのことは全く知りませんでしたあの名前が看板がリゾート行くとあるなと思ってはいたんですけどなんかよく分かんないなと思っていたんですが、えー、行ってみたらどっこいこんなもんがあるんだということで、えー、その時にまあピーターに出会ってですね、当時まああの先生たちも少しインタビューさせていただいてなぜこんなところでこんな人たちが集まってるんだろうということを少し分析してうちにですね、そうだこれシリコンリゾートだなと思ってですね、そこの土地計画的にはこシリコンリゾートシリコンビーチとも言ってました。あのなぜか、まあ、COVID-19 前後からなんですけれども、まあ、LA は比較的もともとからそういう要素はあったんですがマイアミとかは急に盛り上がってきたんですね。なぜ盛り上がってるんで特にもう投資家なんかも集まり始めてですね、まあ、確かに COVID-19 でまあ逃げてきてる部分もあるんですが、まあ、リモートワークもできたりまたなんとなくあのそのアーバンイノベーションエコシステムじゃないものも出始めたなというところで。えーまあ、沖縄みたいなところっていうのはもしかしたらポテンシャルがあるのかなと思い始めた、まあ、世の中の動きということですぜひ皆さんシリコンビーチ覚えてくださいはいここからこれ去年なんですけれどもちょっといい写真なんで持ってきましたうちの秘書が出した方がいいということで去年リゾテックエクスポって知らないけリゾートかけるテックってエクスポが沖縄にあるんですねなんか原点は<笑>あの20年ぐらいまで IT なんとかまあごめんなさいまあ IT バブルみたいなことが沖縄起きた時から始まったんですかねというところで去年あのピーターと一緒にイマジンイノベーションパラダイスオンエンビティティというあの先ほどのピーターの仮説ですねノースキャンパスというものをリアライズできるのかどうかみたいなところをちょっと沖縄の皆さんにも話そうということでお話しした時のものです。はい、でさっきの,あの ULI ですねあの、ピーターから通話しましたけど、これ、アーバン・ランドン・インスティトということで、これ、アメリカから始まった、え実はあの、えー、簡単に不動産業界のダボス会議みたいなところになります、で私、実はこれ、MIT 卒業してからずっと入っている団体で、まあ、あのジャパン・カウンセルというのもあったり、えー、する中で、えー、もうこういう団体があって、いろんな活動をやってます。主にまあディベロッパー投資家建築家建築えー、とうとうが集まって、えー、もともとはアメリカだったんですが今アジアでもです、ね、非常に広まってまして、まあ、2500人で多いで、まあ、2500人のレベルになってきてます日本でも、えー、300人ぐらいの方が会員になっていただいているというところになりますで、えー、こちらでですね、えー、次のページですねあの UL はい、アドバイザーサービスパネルというのがありまして、えー、基本的にはその,その場所のことを分析、まあ、今回はあの、えー、オイストさんの仮説ノースキャンパスでアイディアプランをエグザミンするというようなあプログラムがあったということで、えー、これにぜひマナー手に載せちゃおうということでお願いをしてですね、えー、ただ今回初めてですねそのコビットナインティーンなので、まあ、リモートがメインと、えー、もちろん日本にいる方はあの日本で、えー、行くことはできたんですけれども基本的にはまあリモートでやったものですでこれが今回のメンバー私もワンのメンバーになってるんですけれども、えー、簡単に言うと主に、えー、アジアを中心にした、まあ、ライフサイエンスパークにの開発やマネジメントあと投資に関わっている人たちを、えー、セレクトしてですね、えー、今回の、あのーまあ、ノースキャンパスっていうアイディアを、えーまあ、エグザミンしたということになります。これがそのレポートの,あの、えー、表紙ですね
、であの主な提言というところです。えーっとまああのレポートは非常に厚いのであの少しサマライズしてますけれどもこう一番はですね少に多少コントロバーシャルかと思うんですがあの基礎科学以外のことも一応不動産商売しなくちゃいけないのでまあアプライド応用研究分野もうまく入んないかなというまあすみません商売系がいっぱいあるんですけどそういうような話あとはやはり中核的目標って ESG ですね。やっぱりこれまあ沖縄という場所にもひもづくと思うんですけれどもあといろんなまああの社会の大きなイッシュになっている ESG の話をうまく絡ませられないのかあとは開発経験の段階的推進というのはですねあの非常にあそこのノースキャンプはチャレンジングでですねあの不動産屋的にはあのまああのこんなジャングルを開発するの大変だなと。また1000億円か2000億円かかるかなと思ったんで少しずつでも段階的にできませんかというようなこれはあの実はあのサイトだけじゃなくてオイストはあのえ海のそばにサイトを持っていたりあとはあの実際女村には随分まだまだ土地があるんですねでもうすでにあのコミュニティのインテグレーションも含めてえやるべきじゃないかというのは3つ目ですあとは PR ですねこれもやはりあの日本だけじゃなくてえなかなか海外でもアジアでも知られてないと。いうまあ、多分そのサイエンスの分野のランキングとかっていう部分ってそのインダストリーの方はご存知だと思うんですけれどもまずそれがどこにあるのかみんな分かってないんだろうなということを含めて PR をすべきというところ、まあ、さらにさらなる政府民間からの支持の確保と。いうこ,とこちらもですね本当に、えー、私自身も、あのー、知ってからでこんな宝というかダイヤモンドもったいないなと思って、えーまあ、個人的にも会社としても何かできないかなというようなところでいうと十分あのこういうものを、えー、引っ張れるポテンシャルを持っていると思っていますあと6つ目はグローバル視点からの戦略的パートナー誘致ですね先ほどアメリカ大使館エンバシーの方もいらっしゃいましたけれどもやはり、あのーまあ、オイスト自身がもうグローバルです。あのまあ、もちろん日本にはあるものの多分あの先ほどありましたようにここから渋谷じゃなくて世界に向けた新しい付加価値を作るという部分では十分あの海外からのパートナーはまだまだあるんじゃないかというところあと7つ目が少し始まってるんですが外部のセカホルダーとオイスト代表者の双方で構成させる推進グループって長いんですけど、まあ、スティーリングコミッティみたいなことを今あの、まあ、ピーターなんかと含めてですね、えーまあ、関係しそうな方々を巻き込んでやろうということで、まあ、今日も多分そういう意味での場だと思ってるんですけれども、えー、実際あの今のノースキャンパスのアイデアをリアライズするための具体的な活動を始めていこうというところです。で続きそれのプラスですねまた戻るんですがタレントオールウェイズマーです。まあいい人を集めようよというところが重要だねというところなんですがまあそのメンバーでも一番話題になったのはですね沖縄ならではのクオリティブライフ QOL あるよなというところですね。あのーまあ、まず気候間違いないなというところと、まあ、自然資源青い空青い海ちょうどわざこういう絵が書いてありますあと多分文化ライフスタイルもですね割とスローなところですねでこれ私先ほど出したアーバンえっとエコシアーバンえっとイノベーションエコシステムっていうのはあの比較的ストレスとかあのノイズみたいなところで起きてくるまあイノベーションだという中で、まあ、非常にあの沖縄は違うものがありそうだなと。いうようなところを、えー、今回のさっきの有名なメンバーの中でこれはもう非常に共通な意見でした。あの先ほどのシリコンビーチにつながるんですけれども、多分二十世紀型の、えー、そういうまあ環境が作れるんじゃないかというのがあの今回の UL リポートの主な結論だったというところになります。以上です。Great, thank you very much. So I think you see where we're going. Um, we've got a very powerful core competence, which is the science, which is the global, which is the best governments and best in, best in class development of getting from the intellectual property, from the research, towards a runway, towards successful commercialization. But the North Campus project, I mean, this is a hundred hectares. Um, yes, it is jungle.、Um, to develop it is about as expensive as it is to develop something in Otemachi. So nothing is going to be easy, but this is a public private partnership with which OIST and the leadership of OIST wants to create concrete feedback into sustainable 
innovation ecosystem, sustainable economic development in Okinawa. If you want to get involved, please let us know. We'd be very, very happy. Um, we take Amex and accept all sorts of checks, but not Bitcoin. Um, thank you very, very much, Kanayama-san Peter. Um, I want to move on to one final aspect. We've got the science, we've got the innovation, we've got the future to give back to the community. Something else that in Japan is kind of difficult to talk about, philanthropy. And OIST is also looking to have the best in class model of philanthropy. And for that, uh, I would like to call to the stage, um, excuse me, I would like to call um, uh, uh, to the stage uh, James. James Kondo? Yes. Dr. Murray, I'm sorry, I've lost my script here. Dr. Murray, Dr. Fujita, Dr. Kondo, and Mr. Jaynes. And David, if you can please take over and moderate the panel. So I give you, I give you like everybody else, you get a, an extra time allowance of five minutes. If you go over that, it's a bottle of champagne for everybody in the room. <laughs> And we stand between, uh, af after this are the drinks, so we'll be fast. <laughs> but um, again, this panel is focused on how philanthropy drives excellence in research and education. And I want to uh, give every panelist a bit of a time uh, to answer a core question, which is how and why do you see philanthropy as a driver of excellence in education? And uh, first, I'm going to turn to Cherry. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, well, I come at this question um, from a number of viewpoints because I was in industry for 27 years doing R&D and managing R&D in industry. I was dean of engineering at Harvard for six years. And uh, now I'm at the University of Arizona uh, managing the research program of Biosphere 2. Um, and that is a state university, uh, very big, and um, like OIST is funded by the government and has its own foundation, just like OIST has created the, the um, uh, OIST foundation in the U.S. So, um, Many of you are from industry, and you know return on investment is kind of the bottom line. Um, industry wants to fund things that will bring stockholder, shareholder um, returns. And I say shareholder because ESG is becoming more and more important. Um, so industry. Uh, collaborating with universities and uh, providing gifts to universities um, uh, is very helpful. Um, what, what, it, um, what the collaboration provides for industry is more diversity um, because uh, students are thinking differently. What the philanthropy by the uh, company does is not provide much for the company bottom line, but something for the shareholders, which is they're, they're doing a charity, call it charity, um, but they're also um, helping build a talent pool. So it, it's very good for industry to give gifts to uh, universities at the same time as doing collaboration for things that will end up in products. Um, so I was dean at Harvard. Harvard, as you know, has the largest endowment of any university. It's now 55 billion US dollars. And it provides about 50% of the operating income of Harvard. So if you, if you build up endowment, um, 
you don't have to rely on tuition or government spending. And in fact, I don't know if you know this, but certainly in the US, uh, the US government funds a lot of research. And oh, I forgot to say, it was also a government official funding research at the, in the US. Um, that research is um, about uh, the, the government pays for 80% to the research. The other 20% comes from the universities. It's actually subsidized by the universities. And that comes from either philanthropy or tuition. Um, so um, what does philanthropy do? It provides operating income, um, hard to get. Um, for example, the lights have to be on in order to do the research. It helps bring the best talent to universities. Um, endowed professorships, for example, are very prestigious. Um, universities typically steal faculty members from each other. And having an endowed professorship is a very good deal. Um, students. Uh, fellowships, um, internships, et cetera. And um, very important, it provides, as, as Peter was talking about, um, uh, high trust funding. Uh, government funding is typically peer reviewed, and peers are typically, I mean, I'm talking about scientists here, they're typically quite conservative. So philanthropy allows funding of very high risk projects. So it's critically important for universities to have this. So I will stop there. Sorry. Thank you so much, Cherry. Um, same question to you, uh, Hiro. Uh, how and why do you see philanthropy as a driver for excellence in research and education? Is this on? Yes. OK. Um, actually, uh, David, thank you. Uh, I'm going to speak Japanese, and uh, somebody can translate those, those. You know, into uh, uh, English, right? I want to background of my background. I was born in Japan, and I was born in Japan. I was born in Japan, and I was born in Japan. I was born in Japan, and I was で、ちょうど2年の時にですね、UCSD、カリフォルニア大学、サンディエゴ校に留学するえ、で、その渡米したのが88年です。それから知らない間にもう何十年も経ってしまいまして、アメリカでいるんですけども、今ですね、私はあ、もちろんあの、会社とかも経営はしてるんですけども、全米で最大規模の一つのあの大学にオハイオ
、例えばですね、4000億円ぐらい集めるわけですね、そういう4000億円を集めたらどうするかというと、例えば、えー、医療センター、研究センター、病院を作ったり、もしくはそういうイノベーションゾーン、今、あのまさにオハイオ州っていうのは、インテルが、えー、半導体の工場を、えー、作りますから、そこでまたインテルのエコシステムと、例えばオハイオ州立大学という人材、えー、学生を含めたそういう人材で、こういうネットワーク、まさにあのこのノー,スノースキャンパスと同じようなコンセプトですけれども、やっぱり人が集まるということが、まずイノベーションのきっかけになっていくわけですね、だからそのデンシティを上げていく、そういうときにフィラントロピーというのは非常に大きなやっぱりあの、えー、役割を持つわけです。ククリリブラのクリニックも、えー、10年でパワーオブエブリワンってこれはまあみんなの力というそういう名前をつけてですねちょうど10年間の今ファンドレイジングを終えまして 3.7 ビリオンまあ日本,に日本円で言うと4000億近くですよねこういう資金を使って例えば今度はあのバッキンガムパレスイギリスのバッキンガム宮殿の前にクリーブランクリニックロンドンを作りましたけれどもそういう病院ができてまた世界的ないろんなそういう人材を呼び込んでまたイノベーションを起こしていくと。だからオイストが私はもちろん日本政府が最大の出資者ですけれども、今後、次の10年に行くときに、その多い人にとってフィラントロピーというのは非常に大きな役割を持ってくるわけです。日本ではまだフィラントロピーというのはまだよく知られてはいないんですけれども、私はなぜ多い人が大切かというと、もちろん研究のレベルは高い、そういう国際的な研究大学、大学院であるということはも,うもちろん言及する必要もないですけど、けども私にとっては本当の意味で日本を解放する鍵だと思ってるんですねでそれはなぜかというとまさに先ほどピーター学長がおっしゃってましたけども海外から優秀な人材をあの持ってくる8割近くが海外,海外から来られてるで生徒も6割、えー、海外ですよね。ということは日本の常識が通用しないということですよね。日本の規制概念が通用しない。だからこそ我々はそのいわゆるオイストの人材の中でこういう方向性がいいだろう。まずやってみようというこういうチャレンジャーのチャレンジャースピリットでもっていろいろやるわけですけれども、それができるのは要するに日本の規制概念、日本の常識が通用しないからできるわけです。逆に言うとこれだけ政府に資金を入れていただいて、そしてこれだけ海外から。人材を持ってきてきこれで失敗するということはもし多い人が失敗するということは日本の社会にの日本の未来,未来はないということなんですね僕はそういう危機感を持ってましてまさに多い人の成功というのはもちろんあの多い人ということ自体で大切ですけどもやはり日本をあいろんな意味で解放していくいい意味で解放していくそういう力になればあのいいと思ってますのでもちろんフィラントロピーも日本の他の大学でやってないからまあね日本ではどうだろうってそういう態度ではなくてですねやはり我々が自分で未来を作っていくというそういう何て言うんでしょう、えー、ココリズムをみんなが持ってせっかく海外からこれだけの,あの人材が集まってるわけですからそれは絶対失敗させてはいけないというみんな危機感を持って政府とも交渉してまた企業のパートナー,あのパー,トナーさんともいろいろコラボレーションしてこれは我々が絶対あの日本の未来のために、えー、失敗してはならないプロジェクトだというそういう,あのなんていうかコミュニケーションが大切だと思いますはい藤田先生ありがとうございますじゃあジェームズ、What are your thoughts? So, um, uh, I, I'm recently、uh, signing a strategic partnership agreement with、uh, Peter and Oist, and、uh, they have an office at iHouse. So,、uh, this is very personal.、Uh, Oist is a friend of iHouse.、Uh, I see many friends of iHouse.、Uh, so,、uh, I want to be leaning in、uh, to all the friends to be supportive、uh, of everything that Oist does because it's very、uh, special.、Uh, and、uh, on the point of philanthropy, I think.、Uh, iHouse has、uh, several lessons to offer.、Uh, when,、uh, and it's probably one of the most successful philanthropic、uh, institutions、uh, in Japan.、Uh, in 1952,、uh, in a war torn Japan,、uh, iHouse gathered 7,000 corporations and 5,000 individuals to purchase probably one of the most valuable real estate、uh, in Japan. Uh, that we're sitting in right now,、uh, worth several hundred million dollars.、Uh, and so that was achieved in a war torn Japan,、uh, 
uh, half funded by Rockefeller Foundation, but half funded by 7,000 corporations and 5,000 individuals. So I think there are several lessons uh, to be had, which I think is relevant for OIST. So uh, when you think about 1952 Japan, uh, building a, a place where particularly Americans and Japanese, seven years after the war, uh, would come together to build a prosperous uh, and peaceful Asia in a war-torn Asia was an improbable dream. So we talked a lot about Okinawa. You think you have a hard project. Uh, 1952 Japan, US-Japan relations and friendship in a war-torn Tokyo was a difficult, improbable project. Uh, and building it around the premier garden is almost like get, trying to fund something in Syria right now around the premier garden gathering Russians and Americans and Libyan government to talk about peace uh, in the Middle East. So getting funding for that was very difficult, but it was critical for Japan to return to the international community, for US and Japan to build an alliance uh, during the Cold War, uh, and it was successful. Uh, and I think to do something that is very important uh, but uh, improbable, uh, I think you need two things. So one is you need people who get it. Uh, to form the core. And I think this room is, I recognize most people uh, in this room. Uh, and, and that probably means that you are very, very important people who are very global, who are influential, who can form the core of what needs to happen. Uh, but always, uh, sorry, iHouse did a, a few things that led to the 7,000 corporations and 5,000 individuals. Uh, because the core was only maybe a few dozen people. Uh, in the beginning, it was John D. Rockefeller III, uh, and a few people like Yoshida Shigeru, uh, Shirasujiro, like people who were very international, like people in this room. But Japan is not all full of very international people. So second, they gathered uh, a fundraising committee of the most prominent business leaders, and the fundraising committee itself was about 100 people divided into East Japan, West Japan, but within each, maybe about 10 subcommittees, with a very, very strict order from the head of Bank of Japan, Keiranen, and Keizaido Yukai to get moving, uh, even if you didn't want to get moving. So that was number one. Uh, number two, uh, it gathered uh, cultural leaders, because people needed to know about this place, and people need to know about OIST. So people like Kawabata, the writer, uh, Mishima, another writer, uh, you know, filmmakers, uh, cultural you know, icons were gathering to talk about the importance of this project. Uh, and I think although all of you are rock stars, there are literal rock stars who can let the project be known. And I think it's important uh, that cultural leaders get involved to talk about this story and let the young people and others get excited uh, about what's happening because what you're doing is very exciting. Uh, third, uh, and this is Japan, uh, we got the imperial family fully involved uh, in all the parties. Uh, so the current uh, Emperor Mercius, uh studied a lot here. Uh, most of the royal family was kind of hanging out here. Uh, that was uh, to get the core conservative Japan on board uh, and, and getting their agenda, which was really actually at that time protecting the imperial family uh, from possible ab abolition. Uh, if they saw something very international as opposite to the conservative cause, it would have been different, but they saw it as actually essential uh, to get uh, Japan to preserve its tradition. So I think there are several things that were done to really bring in the whole of Japan around something that is truly improbable and innovative. Uh, and I think if there's anything we can do to recalibrate and, and bring that to this generation around OIST, uh, it would be a privilege for iHouse to be a part of it uh, and, uh, and really rally the crowd to do the next uh, decade of uh, an incredible success that has been built. James, thank you so much. We have probably about six minutes before Jesper cuts me off. So we're going to do a lightning round and, uh, you know, answers in haiku, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, Cherry, let me turn to you first. Could you tell us, in your mind, what do you see as some of the philanthropic priorities uh, for OIS that perhaps people in this room might uh, consider investing in? Uh, first priority is talent. Second priority is talent. 
And the third priority is talent. So what, what that means is professorships, fellowships, student internships, getting more Japanese students fellowships to go to OIST. Um, this is what we need for the innovation district. This is what we need for more startups. And by the way, what Peter said, the uh, graduate, graduates of OIST are staying in Japan. They are going to startups. It's really exciting. And so I, I'm just going to focus on talent for, for this. Thanks so much. Um, Hiro, I want to turn to you for a moment and follow up on something that James talked about, which this institution was founded by Americans and Japanese. Uh, it would not be here without philanthropists from both countries. Tell us briefly, why is the US-Japan network important for philanthropy um, as it might relate to OIST? Um, well, because um, you know, when you think about uh, higher ads in the United States, the best ones, right? I mean, they, as uh, Cherry said, actually, you know, philanthropy and uh, uh, excellence of research or operations, they go together. So, you know, uh, as I said, in order for us to be, uh, uh, you know, bored within the Japanese ecosystem, I think, uh, you know, we have to, because government uh, funding is limited, of course, that it would be great if they can increase, but knowing that, we cannot say that, well, since we are not getting enough, this is where we, are, we, we, this is where we stop, right? I mean, like Peter says, he has a vision to increase 200, you know, to 200 PIs, 300 PIs, to, to uh, maintain, to actually keep the critical mass. To do that, what else can we have? I mean, it's a philanthropy. Without it, we will not succeed, since we know that we have to learn from how the United States have, has been doing, and then we can have a partnership with this great institution. James, you're running a 70th anniversary campaign here. Um, what are you learning about philanthropy in Japan? How is it changing? Is it becoming bigger, more popular? Um, is it still far apart from other parts of the world? So two things. Uh, I think, um, number one, um, many people are dying <laughs> because they're old in Japan. Uh, but the, the legacy gift. <laughs> market is gigantic. If you think about the amounts of wealth uh, that will be transferred uh, in Japan over the next two decades, it is larger than many countries' asset base. Uh, and we have a chance to reach out to those people to write even a portion of that for the next generation and for, for what matters. Uh, and that is an untapped market that's growing at like 100% a year. I would suggest always get right into that. Uh, I think the other thing uh, is there is the large corporate Japan, uh, but there is the new money. Uh, and so we, I see some faces here of people who've made new money. Uh, but uh, most of those people uh, find the traditional Japanese institutions somewhat off offsetting, uh, not, not exciting, not inviting. Uh, and they're interested in the new Japan. They're interested in investing in the future of Japan. Uh, and I think the more OIS can do to tap into that generation and talk about funding the next group of leaders from around the world, uh, there is tremendous amount of money uh, there. And so I think uh, those two things, uh, I don't want to give away my secrets for raising my money, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think uh, both are huge. There is enough money to go around for what's important. Uh, but I think given the importance of Okinawa, uh, last thing I'll mention, uh, the US Embassy. Uh, when we think about the geoeconomic importance of this region and Okinawa, uh, it is an essential piece of peace and stability uh, in this region. So even if people who are myopic uh, have other concerns of funding uh, and things they funded in the past, getting Okinawa to be optimistic, open, global, uh, and, and some not protective uh, about the past is really, really important for all of us. Uh, and so I think you, know, you mentioned Quad, US-Japan relations, Japan. Uh, I think we should go right in uh, to make that story, uh, because I think the future of Okinawa, as someone mentioned, is not about building bridges to nowhere. It's about investing in the next generation with people around us and all our allies. 
Um, James, thank you so much. You bring up something very interesting, and we're going to wrap up here, and, and uh, Jesper's going to ask you to, to donate. Uh, but um, you know, if you look at giving, philanthropic giving in the United States, uh, it's individuals that give the most. Uh, then you have uh, foundations, and then legacy giving bequests. And actually, the least philanthropic are companies. So in the um, giving world in the United States, it's said that dead people give more than yeah, corporations. And, and this is quite interesting to know um, for those who are trying to uh, uh, raise funds for the philanthropic world. Um, I think with that, I'd like to thank each of you, Dr. Fujita, uh, Dr. Murray, uh, Kondo Sensei, uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. There's, this is just the appetizer, uh, but I hope all of you will get engaged uh, with OIST um, in many ways, including philanthropically. Jesper. Great. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists, for a wonderful session. Um, so um, we're actually close to be on time, which is, uh, shows you what um, you know, Japanese um, and German cooperation uh, can actually do. Um, I think, uh, I hope we've whetted your appetite. And I want to close on a little bit of a personal note. Um, I have been stuck in Japan since uh, 1986. Um, 1986 was Koksai Ka Gannen. Uh, 1989 was Koksai Ka Gannen. 1993 was Koksai Ka Gannen. Uh, 1998 was Koksai. I think every year there's some sort of something, something, the opening of Japan, the internationalization of Japan. I got involved with OIST. I think OIST wa Nippon no Kokusai ka no saigo no chance desu. This is the last frontier, the last chance. And it's working. This is the amazing thing. The project, you know, trying for something impossible that is improbable and actually making it happen. That's exactly what OIST has done with the support of the Japanese government, allowing best in class and independence governance and giving the students, giving the researchers the freedom to actually thrive in a way that is the envy of the Weizmann Institute, that is the envy of the Max Planck Institute. Dare I say, it is the envy of Harvard University. So we know what we want. We want a healthy innovation ecosystem. You've seen the different pillows Pillars that pillows. Yes, we're going to sleep. <laughs> That's exactly what we're not doing because you are all in the room. And we have got the different pillars uh, put together here. You must help us getting this going and creating the next year. So, what can you do to actually support? Well, many of you are corporates, are corporate leaders, or your cousin is a corporate leader. <laughs> um, join Eno. This is a very simple step. The innovation network at OIST. Um, there is two categories. One is 500,000 yen, and one is 50,000 yen. Very easy to join. Invest in the OIST venture fund. Um, donation. There is a Furusato uh, corporate, Nose. Furusato Nose does work from since the uh, January of this year. We're working on the Kojin on the individual side, but for the corporate side, this is already uh, working. Get involved with the startup and accelerator program. Become a mentor. Have your team from your company visit OIST and get engaged with the students, with the professor as a mentor. Yes, we are looking to build an incubator. And the Japanese government is so catchy. You know, they just don't give any money. I don't know where they give the money to. But anyways, we are trying to grow the incubator. Um, this is an investment. How about it? Your company's name on the, innovator, on, on the incubator. Anyway, that's a concrete project that we have. Engage with the Okinawa Innovation District Initiative that is just getting off the ground. You've heard from Kanayama-san. Participate in OIST events. And by all means, speak up. Support OIST publicly. 
Whenever you meet somebody, whenever you sing karaoke in Roppongi or the Ginza, sing the Oist song. <laughs> thank you very, very much. We look forward to engaging with you further. Thank you, thank you, thank you.